it may be tea, it may be coffee, and whether it has a direct link to cancer. Well, cancer of the esophagus is thought to be associated with a hot beverage or a hot drink. In Kenya, cancer is the third commonest killer, and cancer of the esophagus specifically is the second commonest cancer in men and the third commonest cancer in women. Cancer of the esophagus is found in various certain regions in the country, like the Rift Valley, the Mount Kenya region, and the Western region. We visited Tenwek Hospital that has been managing patients from all walks of life from this country for cancer of the esophagus to bring you more about this killer disease. My name is Dr. Michael Mwachiro. I am a general surgeon and an endoscopist, and I lead the endoscopy unit here at Tenwek. Uh, my work focuses mainly on uh, seeing patients who have uh, all sorts of digestive diseases, but mainly cancer of the esophagus or the food pipe, which we have a high incidence uh, or high numbers of in this part of Kenya. A study conducted at the Moi Teaching and Referral Hospital linked the consumption of hot beverages to the risk of cancer of the esophagus, perhaps explaining why Kenya presents one of the highest rates of this cancer in the world. Gabriel Mudamba, a 45-year-old from Western Kenya, has just gone through an operation at the Tenwek Mission Hospital to manage his esophageal cancer. Visit on Pati Matibabu, Likona Ambiwa, Ni Alsas. So Lipokuja Pandai, Nikafanya Wuduma Kutosha, Nipo Ikagulika Kwamba, Nikans. Doka Tuo, Pilma Kiliangu, Likola Jotuni Kwamba, Ni Alsas. Manaka Kila, Doctor Koli Kiliambetu, Ni Alsasa Kiliangu, Kome Putia to Apu. Kona Pamada Alsas. Gabriel's situation is not different from the many cases that Dr. Michael Machiro has seen in his time as a consultant general surgeon at the Tenwek Mission Hospital. He explains this cancer burden. Esophageal cancer is the eighth most common cancer worldwide. But if you look at the African numbers, then that changes. So in Kenya, it's the second most cancer, common cancer in men and the third most common cancer in women. This is after breast and cervical cancer. And in parts of Kenya, we see that it's more common. So like in Tenwek, when we did an audit over the last 20 years, we saw that esophageal cancer was the number one most common cancer. There are parts of Kenya, like in uh, central Kenya, in the Embu Meru area, where there, there's a hot spot. In the North Rift, the Eldoret uh, area, there's another spot. And then towards the lake area, Kisumu, Kakamega. And then Nairobi, of course, is another uh, concentration of esophageal cancer cases. Most of the data uh, has shown that high temperatures have been associated with uh, a risk of changing to cancer. So the normal cells of the esophagus get exposed to this heat energy and they begin this transformation process to become cancer. Now, uh, you might ask, what is the, this temperature? The report from IAC a couple of months ago had put out the global average for was around 62 degrees Celsius. We measured our own uh, temperature here at Tenwek and we found 72 degrees Celsius. The Tanzanians measured and they found 70 degrees Celsius. Think about it, that is very hot tea. Uh, and how we did it was we had uh, somebody drink tea and we put something to measure and then when they were ready to drink it, we got the average temperature. So we, here we think people drink very hot tea and because of the studies that have been shown, I think that is one avoidable way that simply, if you simply lower the temperature that you take your tea or coffee, uh, it will have an effect on preventing this type of cancer. If you look at the global uh, map, the esophageal cancer, especially the type we see in Africa, is common along the East African, South African belt and then goes on to China. We see squamous cell carcinoma. The rest of the world sees a slightly different type of cancer. We have been looking at a number of causes, and so 
we have the traditional causes which we are aware of like alcohol drinking and tobacco but uh, we've seen in Kenya there are slightly specific uh, causes like drinking of hot uh, hot tea hot drinks then there's a, a possibility of uh, exposure to smoke from wood firewood or charcoal and we think this carbon content is also driving the higher numbers of esophageal cancer that we are seeing we've seen a strong family history or a genetic component so when we did the Chenwick data we found that the cancer was common in males and women. It was equally common. However, if you look at the 2018 Global Can data for Kenya as a country, uh, they had an interesting observation in there because they had slightly more women than men. However, if you look at the average ratios, it was almost one to one. Globally, uh, the cancer is seen to be more in men than in women. If you look at the whole world, like all the numbers in general, and so I think. Uh, in Kenya and in Bomet, part of the explanations that we are offering is that the women get exposure to smoke because of the cooking that they do, especially in the traditional huts where they have um, you know, these windowless huts and they are exposed to smoke every day when they are preparing food for their families, which might explain why we are seeing uh, men and women having equal uh, numbers of, of, uh, of cancer. <laughs> The symptoms for dyspepsia or ulcer disease mimic the symptoms for esophageal cancer, especially at the beginning stages before you get complete blockage of the pipe. And so they will come with this pain that is in their uh, abdominal area that they cannot understand. And many times they're labeled as ulcer. So anyone who is complaining of uh, that reflux or ulcer like, like symptoms, really it's good to get a screening endoscopy done to make sure that it truly is just reflux disease and it is not cancer which is masquerading with that symptom. If any members of the public uh, have uh, either difficulty in swallowing or if they notice that they are having a pain with swallowing, you know, like they realize today I was taking my food and for some reason I'm having pain, they should have a, an endoscopy procedure done. If you notice that you're having vomiting blood, that's not normal. You should come in for an endoscopy procedure. And the other thing uh, which is not uh, as common is weight loss. So if you notice uh, you're having these symptoms and your clothes are getting looser and looser, then you should definitely have a screening done for you. Okay, so, uh, uh, Wakati lipoona sipati na fu, ilikuwa kazini. Kazidu siku sana. Lipo fika subuhi kafe mkubwa wangu. Minendo kuma tibabu. Naroku. Lipo enda kule naroku. Waka lirafaa panda ito enyewe kusputo. Nika kuja huku. Waka nipokea vizuri. Waka nifanyia exercise nyingi sana. Kansoli. Sasa from there, tutukaanza kuingia kwa processing. Namna, yani kujua ni ugonjwa inagani. Nipagia pale, nilienda kwa endoscopy kwanza. Kutoka hapo, wakaniambia ni kujia majibu wadae. Manaka kuna test nge ilikuwa mepileko na Nairobi. Ndiyo ikijwa kompai ni pamoja na yuwa une kama ni kitu, kitu moja. Nilipo kuja, ikawa kule ni hiyo. Ya tatu, wakanipileka kwa CD scan. Ikatoa the same same. We have been seeing patients present late, so these are uh, stage three and four, but I think it's partly because of the challenges towards care that we face. Very rarely do we see patients who are really early in the disease. And to help you understand, part of it is because of the nature of this type of cancer. It grows inside the food pipe. So by the time a patient is noticing I cannot swallow, it has grown enough to block the passage. So by definition, they come in when they are uh, late stage uh, patients. Uh, this makes it, of course, a bit more challenging to offer care because of the transport issues, cost, lack of diagnostic equipment. So you need an endoscopy suite where you have uh, this procedure where we take a camera on a, at the end of a, this tube, we pass it through the mouth and we look at the food pipe and the stomach 
and we look for the cancer. So you need to go to an area which has that service. Um, many uh, areas in Kenya are now beginning to have these endoscopy uh, centers, but in the last uh, 10, 15 years, it wasn't as common as it is now. So access to diagnostic services really has played a part in patients coming in late. The other thing um, that I would like to bring out is what I call um, fear or fatalistic attitude. Um, so that means patients are afraid that if I go and they find something, I will die. Or if you diagnose this cancer, uh, I will probably die. Or if you touch it, so we normally do a biopsy. We take a sample to confirm that it is cancer. Uh, some people are afraid that if the doctors touch it, it will continue growing. And this, uh, really, these myths have fueled uh, patients being afraid to come for care early enough when there is hope for a cure. Hakutaka Sasa vile umejua kieni ya ugonjwa wako, tufanya bidu tujue jeans vile unasafanya nini kutibiwa. Treatment for sphagial cancer is a team effort. So I will divide it into two. Uh, the first part is we need to diagnose uh, the problem, and that involves multiple people. So you need somebody who is able to do an endoscopy, either the gastroenterologist, or a surgeon. You also need uh, radiologic services, so we do imaging. In some places they do a barium swallow, so they take a dye which is visible on an x-ray, so we shoot the picture and you see where it doesn't go further, and then you can suspect there is a cancer there. So you need those diagnostic uh, capabilities. Then the second bit is now looking at the actual treatment, and so to help us understand the spectrum, I will look at the different stages that they come in. So there is curative uh, patients and then there is palliative patients. So those who come in early uh, qualify for curative service, I mean surgery. So this means we are able to remove the cancer and get a complete cure. If they come in very early, which is very rare uh, uh, in this country, we are able to do actually treatment via endoscopy. So they don't need a big operation. All we do is we put in the endoscopy, we find the area that has the early cancer and we can resect it or we can use um, heat energy to ablate or to uh, destroy that area that has cancer and they get a cure. So you can see we removed all his esophagus and now we just have uh, stomach remaining. So the, the new food pipe is now what used to be the stomach. Uh, when the cancer has grown more, it is not just on the surface, it is involving more of the food pipe, so it is going into the wall of the food pipe. Then now you need to have a, a resection. Uh, so you need to remove that part. And uh, this involves having a procedure we call an esophagectomy. So esophagectomy means removing the esophagus. Uh, it's a long operation, and you need to, first of all, start with opening the chest. We uh, free the esophagus, and then we open the abdomen. We free the stomach, and then we remove the part that has the cancer, so all of the esophagus comes out, and a little bit of the stomach. And then we pull up the stomach, uh, to form a new, this will become their new food pipe. That's what they now they'll be eating. And then now we make a, a repair, a surgical repair. Um, the third bit is patients who come in late. So if you come in uh, fairly advanced, then uh, there are two options. One is, are we able to try and shrink this cancer? Uh, so now I'm introducing the concept of working with our oncology colleagues. Because for many of these cancers, and esophagus, as we've seen, uh, if you do uh, chemotherapy and radiotherapy, so chemotherapy is we inject a drug in the veins and that shrinks the cancer, and radiotherapy is uh, they administer heat energy to uh, X-ray energy to the part that has the cancer to try and shrink it. We've seen that it is able to become smaller and makes the surgery much easier. So for some patients, they're able to benefit from that and they can still be offered surgery. The last category is patients who come in so late that the cancer has now grown not just into the food pipe, it is now involving the heart, 
the breathing pipes, and it is now difficult for you to remove that cancer without uh, uh, endangering these patients. So for this type of patients, then they qualify for palliative care and hospice care. So mainly in Kenya, the options are either you get uh, palliative chemo and radiotherapy. So essentially we try and treat you to shrink the tumor and stop it from spreading, even though we already know it has gone to other parts. The second bit is uh, they, these patients now need nutrition because they cannot swallow. Uh, the food will not get to the stomach. In the event that cancer of the esophagus is not diagnosed early, there are other ways of managing the patient to improve their quality of life. The use of stents as a palliative treatment for esophageal cancer is largely due to diagnosis at very late stages where curative treatment is not possible. This is an esophageal stent. Uh, it's what we typically call a self-expanding metallic stent. As you can see, it's very pliable, uh, and the reason for that is uh, for us to deploy it into the food pipe, we have to load it. They come with a delivery system. Uh, so you can see these are uh, sample uh, stents that have not been opened. So essentially, this gets loaded into this. It is able to shrink down, and then we introduce that into the food pipe. And once we deploy it, it opens again to this position. And the whole concept of this is when you have an obstruction in the food pipe, when you put in the stent, it opens up and allows food to cross from above the area that was blocked to the stomach. So this allows the patients to have nutrition, um, especially for patients who uh, are palliative, who we know that for sure will not be able to offer them anything else. Occasionally, we also use it uh, for patients who come in and they could be surgical candidates but are not in good nutritional status. So we put it as a temporary uh, feeding aid to help them to feed and then when they get better nutrition, we put them through the procedure. It's, this stent gets embedded into the food pipe. So what that means is there's a part that is coated which will not have any tissue around it. And then there's a part, uh, on this one is the top part, which does not have a coat, and the tissues will grow around it and hold it into place. When you do the surgery to remove the tumor, we usually remove the tumor and the stent, and then we discard it and the tumor is sent for pathology. If the tumor is very low, so if it's near the stomach, occasionally this will hang into the stomach, and those patients have to deal with the problems of reflux. We put them in endoscopic, so there's no surgery involved. We simply uh, do the endoscopy procedure. So we pass this camera, we put a wire, and then we deploy or we open the stent, and it keeps the food pipe open, and they're able to eat. In some areas where there is no access to these stents, then they have to do uh, a feeding tube via surgery. Uh, of course, these patients normally are very weak and frail, and so uh, we've seen, especially in our experience here at Tenwick, that they have uh, difficulties with that type. So we've mainly been doing the palliative uh, stents as a way of offering nutrition. The last uh, component of this whole treatment is now the hospice care, because these patients need support. Um, they are having pain, they are having troubles with nutrition, and so in Tenek, we have a program where we, we enroll them and we go out to their homes. We visit them in their houses after they've had the procedures and we check on them. If they need to have pain medication, we prescribe for them the morphine and they're able to access that. And we also generally see how they are doing. We've had a number of patients uh, opt to get uh, the conventional medical treatment, but still at the same time go and visit uh, either the herbalist or the traditional, uh, especially here in, in our setup, there are these traditional uh, healers, if I can call them. And uh, a number of patients opt to go for that um, treatment. But I think if you look closely, uh, that really shows us that the patients are looking for hope. They are trying to find, is there something else that I can cling on, that I can, can help me handle this uh, new cancer that I've just been told I have. Loss to follow up, uh, this means patients who go away and don't come back, is, a, is an issue not just for palliative patients. Even for some where you catch it early, 
when you tell them about the diagnosis and you go over the different treatment options and then they say, well, let me go and talk to my family and sometimes you don't see them again. Uh, they go and they are simply afraid to come back. And so that's one thing we need to keep uh, telling our, our public that if you have these symptoms, this, if caught early, can be treated and can be cured. And if we are unfortunate that we catch it late, then we work with the patients to help them to manage their disease. This is actually good. I honestly don't think we need to go any further. Yeah, it's okay. Yeah, so it looks like everything is working fine. What we have discovered over time, because in the 20 years, 25 years, we've learned that on top of offering the palliative care, how do we help to give hope even to the uh, relatives and the caregivers? Because one of the things, and we see it in clinic, when you tell a, a patient you have cancer and automatically the family start wondering, oh, what about me? If, if this patient has cancer, I could get the cancer. And so we have started, and we've been doing this uh, uh, screening exercises where we offer, if you have a relative who has cancer, we want you to come in and get a screening procedure. Kulegana maybe, jinsi vilo 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 jua, no, watu ito wajui. Unaona. Na sa zingene, unajua madakitaro kwa tafauti. Unaweza kwenda kwa kuambia na alisasi. Unaweza kuputilishia wakati wako pale mbure. Kumbe siyo hiyo. Unaona. Lakini kama wakekua na fifosa kutosha, kama tenueko hospital. How can we catch this cancer early? Uh, and especially in Kenya, if you look at the global can data from this year, the high numbers, the, the new cases was almost equal to the patients who are dying. So we need to reduce that gap. That as much as we are catching them, the patients who are dying, that number should become smaller. And so we uh, have been working on early detection programs and one of the earlier studies that we did was we went out to the community, we explained to them this issue and we brought them in for screening endoscopies. So for you to be able to do early detection because of the nature of this cancer, currently we can only do that through endoscopy. So the patient come, comes into the endoscopy unit, we pass the, food, uh, the endoscopy machine into the food pipe and similar to cervical cancer, we spray the food pipe with Lugol's iodine. The areas that do not have a cancer will take up the dye. The areas that have cancer will not take up the dye, and that's the area you focus on. And we've been able to uh, offer, because then you can offer endoscopic treatment, so we can remove just that portion, and, and this is able to offer them early treatment. You can see that's where the stomach, uh, what was removed, and the, the new neosophagus, so the stomach, we're looking back at ourselves at the junction, and you can see that's where we did the um, suturing of the esophagus to the stomach. So we connected the two with sutures, yes. And then I'm going to go back to normal view. I think we need to work on having more specialists, not just uh, uh, people who can remove the cancer surgically, but also the medical oncologists, the radiographers, because for you to properly diagnose this cancer, you need each of those, and to treat it, you need the surgeon, the gastroenterologist, the oncologist, the radiographers, and the support services. So one way that Kenya is growing as a country, and I think already a number of centers are offering these types of training, is having more specialists being trained to deal with this cancer. Here at Tenwek Hospital, we uh, recently started offering training in cardiothoracic surgery because we noticed that need, and now we are focusing how can we increase the number of uh, surgeons were able to offer this type of surgery. The other bit uh, that I see with room for growth in Kenya is simply having enough centers that are able to diagnose. As we talked about earlier, many patients come in late because they are trying to be sent from one area to another as they are trying to figure out what's wrong with this patient. So if we had each of the counties have uh, in their county hospitals a wing that is able to offer a diagnostic uh, services for sphagial cancer and curative services for sphagial cancer, that really is the future so that people don't have to travel. Uh, we've seen patients who've come all the way from Kwale to our hospital here in Bomet. We've seen patients come from Kakamega to our hospital here in Bomet. So if we had these services available in the different parts of the country, then uh, that would really save costs and time. The last bit is uh, what I call research and innovation. And so we want to be able to care for, offer world-class care in Kenya. 
as other parts of the world. If we as a country can allocate funding and resources to those components, we will be able to reduce the burden and reduce on those graphs the people who die, that fraction really can really shrink as opposed to the number of new cases that we catch. Kwanza, ni kama tu ugonjwa mwingine wa kawaida. Kwa sababu hata kama ni malaria inaua. Sio? DP inaua. Ugonjwa wote inaweza kuua. So that's what you feel. Unaona? Lakini daktari wangu akaniambia akanipatia counseling. One of the things that we have tried, and actually over time now we've got more buying, is helping patients to understand that uh, when you get the cancer diagnosis, that does not simply mean that's it. You know, if if we are able to work together, in as much as you are in uh, the, uh, especially if you catch it late, you are still able to have a better quality of life, and so. This, uh, for us, um, has meant being more engaging in the discussions. And actually, in our endoscopy department, we have a, a staff uh, chaplain and the social workers who work with us with these discussions. They help us to explain the diagnosis to the patient, explain the changes uh, in lifestyle that will happen. Uh, because when you put in this tense, it allows them to have a more dignified um, way of life. Saizi, nezakula, nezatembea, nezatecheka. Anaona, lakini wakati usi ukua na fraa sana, because tukua na feel a lot of pain, singeweza kukula, sina fraa, nimekata a lot of weight. Imagine if every day you cannot swallow even your own saliva. Uh, you've seen, with, when the patients come in, they have this little plastic bag and they're spitting into it. And now when you put in the stent, at least they're able to feed, they're able to maintain their nutrition. And even the family see it is much easier because they can take their pain medications, they're able to to interact better with their caregivers and their relatives. And me pata changa moto, na niko experience sasa ya kutosha. Hata nita kapotoka hapa hivi, hiyo ndi abara mba nita kapo, perekea nyumbani, kwa villagers. Moto kama waina hiyo, asije, akaketi tuwa ya kwamba, atini hali sasa apana. Anatakana, ajua jinsi alivyo, aneza kuenda pahali, ama aneza kuenda kuja na ye huku, apimwe, kwa sababa kuna facilities za kutosha. Kama na halsas, utahipo na halsas ni kweli. Anake, mtakitato hapa, hawa batishi. Kama ni kanza, utakwabia ni kanza. Alafu, unanza, kwa na step by step, step by step, unapato uponaji. Kenya is one of the leading producers of coffee and tea in the world. And as a country, our fondness for the hot beverage is almost unmatched in the region. Kenya as a developing country increasingly continues to bear the burden of cancer. And while one may be genetically predisposed to some type of cancers, doctors advise against lifestyles or habits that increase your risk. So next time you reach for a hot cup of your favorite beverage, think about it before you take that sip.